All right, what I'm going to be doing here is um, just going over some examples of trig limits. All right, now before we get started, I've wrote some uh, various trig properties with limits and some trig identities here that you want to make sure that you recall. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x, or if I reverse that same thing, is going to be equal to 1. The limit as x approaches 0 of tan x over x, and again, if I reverse that around, it's also going to be equal to 1. So those are things that we're going to want to look for and try to manipulate our limits to include so that we can easily find the limits on those. All right, on some rare occasions, we might have to do some substitution for some trig identities. So uh, a real common one would be sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. All right, if I solve that equation for sine squared x, all right, I could subtract cosine squared x from both sides. All right, I could do possibly a substitution with that. And then you can't forget some double angle formulas. Cosine of 2x is equal to cosine squared x minus sine squared x. All right, but just a you know, refresher, I thought I would start out with some of those before we attempt some of these limits. All right, now as our first example, I think I want to do one that's um, not too bad, kind of straightforward here. Um, if I do, say, the limit, as x approaches 0 of x plus 2 all over cosine x. All right, now looking at that, I'm not going to be able to uh, come up with anything with a sine x over x or even with tangent. All right, so the, you never want to forget that you always want to try direct substitution first if you can. All right, so on this one, if I do try the direct substitution on this, then I can immediately plug in 0 for x on both of those. I would have a 0 plus 2 all over cosine of 0. The numerator then is going to be 2. The denominator cosine of 0 is 1. And a direct substitution on this one works out real nice. Okay, so don't forget direct substitution because that's definitely something that you want to try first on every, every trig limit. All right, now let's take a look at another one. If I had something that looked like, say, the limit as x approaches 0, and maybe my numerator is a 5x plus sine x all over x. All right, um, a quick um, direct substitution here. That's going to be 0 plus sine of 0 is going to be 0. And then 0 on the bottom, I'm going to get 0 over 0. That's going to give me an indeterminate form. So then I am going to have to try some manipulation here. Okay, now I do see a sine x over x right there, and I know that that's one of my trig identities. So I'm going to break this up. Okay, now when you break it up, I'm going to have the limit as x approaches 0. Now, the one thing when breaking it up, you just have to make sure that when you put it back together that you end up with what you started. So when I break this up, I'm going to break it up into 5x over x plus sine x over x. Okay, now go backwards. Check to see if you've broken this up correctly. If I can add these two fractions and come up with this, then I know I've broken it up correctly. When adding fractions, you've got to have like denominators. All right, that would put an x on the bottom and then just simply adding the top. So I did break it up correctly. All right, now I can algebraically cross off my x's right there, and then sine x over the uh, x, we know this is going to go to 1. All right, I am taking the limit of this entire thing so that I don't have to, you know, write the limit of this plus the limit of that. Okay, let's just put those big brackets around there so I don't have to do that. Okay, um, so the limit of a constant is going to be that constant, so I'm going to have a 5 plus, this is a known trig identity, limit rather, trig property, so I can do 1 right there, overall limit being 6. So that one's pretty straightforward. All right, now let's take a look at another one. Um, let's do another one where we have to break it up. All right. Okay, let's take a look at, say, the limit as x approaches 0 of maybe, say, 6x squared plus 3x sine x all over x squared. Okay, so again, I'm seeing a sine x there. I've got a couple x's here on the bottom, so that's looking good there. But I do have addition going on in the top. 
All right, again, I should really check direct substitution first. Plugging in zero is going to give me zero there. Sine zero is going to give me zero. I'm going to get zero over zero again, which is pretty obvious there. All right, so when I break this up, I've got addition in the top. I need my numerators to be the same. So I'm going to go the limit as x approaches zero. 6x squared over x squared plus 3x sine x all over x squared. Okay, now if you're not sure if you broke it up right or not, take the two fractions and see if you can add them back together to get that right there. I need common denominators. I have common denominators, all right, which would then just be adding the numerator up back up there. So then, yes, I did break it up correctly. All right, I've got an x squared and an x squared here. That algebraically is going to cancel really nice. I've got one x there. I've got two x's in the bottom, so I can get rid of those. All right, again, I am taking the limit of this entire quantity. That will prevent me having to write that too many times. Okay, so I'm going to be doing the limit of a constant. All right, and then over here, I can do a little bit more separating. I think I am going to write one more line. The limit as x approaches 0. I'm going to have my 6 right here. Plus 3 times sine x over x. Just kind of re rewrote that line to clean it up a little bit. There's my sine x over x, which is the property I know, multiplied by 3 right there. So now I can work this out. Limit as x approaches 0 of a constant. Then it's going to be my constant 6 plus 3 times 1. 3 times 1 is 3 plus 6 more. That's going to give me a limit of 9. Okay. Um, let's do one more. I think I'm going to go to an entire new piece of paper. Uh, really big limit. Let's try another one. Um, this one I'm going to do, um, it's going to involve a different process, not the breaking up, okay? Because um, there's obviously more than one approach that you can try on these trig limits. So this is going to be a totally different approach here. Let's do the limit as x approaches 0 of x sine x all over 1 minus cosine x. All right, I can do a quick uh, direct substitution there, 0 times 0 is going to give me 0 in my numerator, 1 minus cosine 0, that will give me a 1 right there, 1 minus 1 gives give me another 0 in the denominator. Direct substitution is going to result in 0 over 0 in determinate form, so I do have to come up with another strategy. Okay, now, um, not that you would necessarily just automatically think of this, but after you do enough of these, it, it will start to become natural. All right, I can look at this uh, denominator right here, and I can think, oh, well, maybe possibly if I multiply by the conjugate, all right, I'm going to force the difference of two squares there, and that's going to ultimately maybe lead to something else that's going to be helpful. So that's going to be my approach. I'm going to see this 1 minus cosine x, and I'm going to choose to multiply by the conjugate. So 1 plus cosine x over 1 plus cosine x. All right, kind of just like a little trick in your you know bag of tricks that you're going to memorize and use quite frequently. All right, now, when I simplify this numerator, I'm not going to get in a big hurry to multiply it out or anything. I'm going to leave it the limit as x approaches 0, and I'm just going to write, the, write it down next to each other. No need to get in a big hurry about multiplying that stuff out just quite yet. All right, now, I chose the conjugate down here on the bottom because that factored into the difference of two squares, so I can real quickly multiply that out and come up with what it's going to be. 1 squared is going to be 1. All right, I know it's going to be a minus. And then cosine x times cosine x is going to give me a cosine squared x. All right, now, this is where the uh, trig identities that I had wrote down on that first piece of paper is going to come in handy. All right, you really do need to have these memorized and feel comfortable enough with them that you just automatically see things. All right, we know sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. All right, if I solve this equation for sine squared x, that's going to be simply subtracting cosine squared x from both sides of the equation. I'm going to have that right there. That's what's going to be helpful because I should recognize 1 minus cosine squared x. So that's the substitution that I am going to make. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite the limit as x approaches 0. x sine x, 1 plus cosine x. Making the substitution here on the bottom. I'm going to do a sine squared x. All right, now 
I can see that I can cross some things out. I've got a sines x in the top, and I've got two of them in the bottom. So the guy in the top goes away, and that becomes a little one, so I've only got one in the bottom. All right, now I'm getting closer to things I know. I've got an x and a sine x in the bottom. That's going to be one of those trig properties that I can implement. And then this over here is just kind of, kind of be left over. I can do a direct substitution on that part. So if I rewrite it so that I can see things a little bit clearer here, the limit as x approaches 0, I'm going to rearrange. I want x over sine x because that's one I know. And then I'm going to leave that 1 plus cosine x right there. All right, I'm taking the limit of this entire quantity. Okay, this one's going to be 1. Over here, I'm going to do a direct substitution. So on this part right here is a direct substitution at this point, and this one is one of our little trig properties that we already know. All right, so this is going to go to 1. Direct substitution over here is going to be 1 plus cosine 0. Okay, cosine 0 is 1, so I've got 1 times 1 plus 1. That's going to give me a 2. 2 times 0, is, or 2 times 1, sorry, is 2. All right. Now, that one, I mean, that one's a little bit different. You've got to kind of know this little trick of multiplying by the conjugate. You've got to then recognize things like this being something you know as a trig identity. All right. But doing enough of these, you will get to the place where things like that become second nature. All right. I'm going to do one more that involves a trig identity like that. A little more complicated on this one. All right, but we might as well gradually work our way up to the most difficult ones that we can. All right, so for our, my last example here, let's do the limit as x approaches pi over 4. Okay, now notice this is as x approaches pi over 4, so none of our, you know, trig properties are going to work. So that's okay. We probably, you know, dead giveaway that either direct substitution or our trig identity is going to be something that we're going to need to do. All right, let's suppose the function is sine x minus cosine x all over cosine 2x. Okay, now you really should do a direct substitution first. If I plug in pi over 4, pi over 4, pi over 4 there, all right, I am going to get a 0 over 0, which is an indeterminate form, so that means I'm going to have to try something else. All right, now, one of our uh, trig identities that hopefully you're remembering is one of the double angle formulas cosine of 2x is equal to cosine squared x minus sine squared x. All right, and if you don't have these memorized, then maybe using, you know, if you give a trig reference sheet sitting right next to you, then you can, like, look over and see if anything rings a bell here. All right, but I can do that substitution in that denominator. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite with that substitution the limit as x approaches pi over 4. I'm going to do a sine x minus cosine x in my numerator. I'm not changing that. I'm going to now make that substitution. Cosine squared x minus sine squared x. All right, now at first glance, you're going to think, okay, well, that didn't help me. All right, however it did, you should recognize this as the difference of perfect squares. All right, I can now factor this. You know, when this is a perfect square and this is a perfect square and that's a minus, then I can factor this. All right, so that is going to be our goal. We're going to want to factor that denominator now because it's written in a form that we can do that. All right, so as I rewrite the limit as x approaches pi over 4, again, numerator is just going to sit there for a while, not doing anything with it. All right, now, when I rewrite that uh, denominator factored, I'm going to have cosine x minus sine x. And then I'm going to have cosine x plus sine x. And it got really long there. Okay, now, hopefully the point of factoring would then be to make something cross out. Now, really close, but not identical. I've got a positive sine and a negative cosine, a positive cosine, negative sine. So it's not exactly matching, but I can force it to be matching. If I do a little bit of more factoring, okay, if I look at this numerator, you could choose to do it anywhere. I'm going to choose to do it in the numerator. All right, right here, if I factor out a negative 1, factor out a negative 1, okay, then that's going to, in essence, change the signs of everything right there, and then I'm going to be able to cross some things out. All right, so we're going to have the limit 
as x approaches pi over 4. All right, I'm going to factor out a negative 1. So if I factor out a negative 1, I'll just go ahead and put it there, I guess. That's going to leave me with a negative sine x minus, oh, excuse me, it will be a plus cosine x. All right, now, if you're not exactly sure if that's it or not, multiply that back out and see if you get that. Negative times a negative makes it a positive sign. And that's going to match. Negative 1 times a positive cosine will give me a negative there, so it does match. Okay, then my denominator, I'm just going to leave. I'm not ready to cross anything out just quite yet. Cosine x plus sine x. Okay, now, these two things match now. If you wanted, you could take one more step and rewrite this into cosine minus sine x. You don't have to. Those two are both positive. These two are both negative. All right, you ought to be able to see then that those two are going to cancel now. This is going to cancel, and that's going to cancel. Okay, in which case we will then have the limit as x approaches pi over 4. I've got a negative 1 in my numerator, and in my denominator, cosine x plus sine x. All right, now finally I'm ready for a direct substitution. All right, I can do that direct substitution, putting in pi over 4 for my x's. Negative 1, cosine pi over 4, plus sine pi over 4. If need be, you get your unit circle out, check that out. Hopefully you've got that memorized being radical 2 over 2. All right, from here on out, it's arithmetic, just kind of simplifying and, and working this out. Cosine pi over 4 is radical 2 over 2. Sine of pi over 4 is radical 2 over 2. If I added that denominator, I'm going to get a negative 1 over 2, radical 2 over 2. All right, and like I said, this is all arithmetic the rest of the way out. Those twos cross out. All right, probably rationalizing that denominator is going to be a good idea. Negative square root of 2 over 2 for that limit. All right, but point of this limit being a couple different things. All right, recognizing, oh, I've got a trig identity. I've got to do a substitution. Once you see that substitution or you do it, then you've got to realize that you had the opportunity to factor all right, and then this idea when you've got something really, really close but not quite matching, then if you factor out negative 1, it's going to alternate your signs there so that things cross out kind of nicely for you. All right, so there's some extra trig limits that might help if you're struggling with trying to find trig limits.